Well, thanks for watching uh, Abounding Grace Radio's video uh, program today. Uh, we're thankful you've taken time out of your day to watch the program. Today we have on the program my good friend, fellow pastor in the United Reformed Churches, Dr. Dan Borvin. Uh, we have a good, lively discussion on preaching, the means of grace, uh, the mission of the church, and things that are important for us to consider in light of the challenges of our day. You can find all of the resources uh, and other videos in the past at agradio.org. Thanks today for, for watching the program. All right. Uh, we have uh, Dan Borvin with us today on Abounding Grace. Dan, it's good to, uh, good to have you with us on the good program. Good to be here. Yeah. How are you doing? Great. Yeah. Yeah. Loving life. Good. Good. Dan, um, Dan is a pastor in the United Reformed Churches, and he's in Torrance, California. And Dan, also, you, got, you have a PhD. Where'd you I do. do your, where'd you do your PhD? Oxford University in England. Okay. What was the, what was the subject? I worked on the French Reformed Church of the Reformation period, uh, particularly a guy named Pierre Dumoulin, mm -hmm. who was a pastor in Paris. He was yeah. kind of the most well-known of the French Reformed pastors and theologians in the early 17th century. Yeah. So I worked on his debates with Roman Catholics mm -hmm. of that day. They kind of, I call him a theological hitman. <laughs> Anytime the French Reformed Church, he went after. He went after them. He did. He went after yeah. everybody. Yeah, he was. He so was anytime the French fearless. Reformed churches had a polemical issue, they basically asked him to address it. So, and a lot of those guys in the French Reformed churches, I mean, there, some of them were martyrs. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Especially prior to his era, his father's era. His father was a pastor as well. Um, many of those pastors were martyred, and he was almost martyred. Yeah. So in in um, yeah, you think the guy writing against Rome the way he did? <laughs> it was personal. <laughs> so in 1572 is the Saint Bartholomew's Day massacre. Uh -huh. Yeah. In Paris, when we don't know how many Protestants were killed, Pro m many people say at least three thousand, maybe as many as fifteen to twenty thousand yeah. wow. were killed. Yeah. Um, it was it was a true massacre. And so uh, Pierre Dumoulin, his father, Joachim, was a French Reformed pastor, and he was a target. The Catholics had him on the kill list. Wow. And so he wow. and his wife went one direction. They sent the children in another direction so as to throw off the Catholic troops who were hunting them. Mm -hmm. And Pierre and his sister end up in a farmhouse owned by a Roman Catholic lady, and the Catholic troops are at the door and this uh, Catholic farmer's wife hides Pierre and his sister under a bed <laughs> and the Catholic troops come in wow. and they're searching the house for him, wow. for the, the Dumoulin family. And as they get near the bed, the farmer's wife knocks a pitcher off a shelf to distract the Catholic <laughs> soldiers. And so they leave the room without searching the bed. Wow. And so Pierre's four years old at this time, and he's he's like whimpering yeah. when, understandably, when the Catholic soldiers are coming in to kill him. And his sister tries to quiet him and nearly smothers him to death wow. while she's covering his mouth wow. as the soldiers are going room to room. So he certainly had a vendetta yeah. against Rome, understandably. Um, <laughs> his his uh, brother, uh, later on in the French Wars of Religion, was a soldier for the Huguenots and he was killed mm -hmm. by the Roman Catholics. Uh, there are reports that he was buried alive. Yeah. Wow. So Pierre doesn't, he doesn't get, um, in his theological writings, he's certainly professional. <laughs> he yeah. doesn't make it personal, you know, slandering or anything like that, but there is a passion that he has against the Roman Catholics that maybe others who had not had his experience would not have had. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, I mean, this was actual persecution, you know, um, the French reformed church was one of the most persecuted yeah. of all the reformed churches of that era. Yeah. yeah. He also wrote uh, anatomy of Arminianism and he, he went after them fiercely. In he went work, after the right? Arminians with both barrels. Yeah. yeah. They, so the French reformed were barred from attending the synod of Dort Pierre Dumoulin was a delegate to mm -hmm. the Synod, but the French king said, if you go, you can't come back. Yeah. So he was not able to attend, but he did send a letter to the Synod. And then after the Synod, he published The Anatomy of Arminianism, yeah. which is, is available in English. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it is hard to get. I, I, had, a, I had an original copy years wow. ago and I sold it. I, I always regret that. Man. I, yeah. can't, I can't find it again. 
So well, you can find it on Google Books if you want yeah. just the PDF of it. If if anyone's yeah. interested in reading it, it is rather lengthy. Yeah, but um, but it's good. He like, takes them down. It is it is a takedown. Yeah, yeah. I if anyone struggles with that, that's that's a book to read. You know? Right. But, but he hasn't been he hasn't been largely published. I, I mean, he's kind of a forgotten in right. some ways for reform. Which is why I wanted to study the French Reformed Church yeah. in general, because to English speakers, yeah, these great men are for the most part lost. Yeah. Yeah. And there's so many wonderful works that they mm -hmm. have that many have been already uh, rendered into English, mm -hmm. but also in French and in Latin that I, I would love to see translated and yeah. made available to English speakers today because there's so many wonderful theological works that are just lost to the yeah. English-speaking world. Yeah, that's true. It is remarkable, though. I mean, RHB and these what, what they're putting out today, what we have access to, it's just unreal for us. We have no real excuse. You know, it's like everything that was written of importance, most of that stuff for us, we can get our hands on and read. So yes. Even as as recently as, you know, 75 years ago or whatever, with with Martin Lloyd Jones. Yeah. Trudging through bookshops across the UK just trying to find anything yeah. available. And now we have so much yeah. a click away on Google Books. Yeah. Anything you could possibly want yeah. available on Google Books, just about. It is a remarkable time to be alive. Yeah, it is. And the resource that we have. So, <laughs> yeah, you're struggling a bit with bronchitis. So if he's coughing in the microphone, you know, we're not going to cut that yeah, out. Yeah, I don't, I don't have this uh, natural baritone that I do right now. <laughs> you, I, sound, you sound pretty good. I'm thinking about singing bass, you know, <laughs> maybe uh, maybe covering some Barry White tunes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm glad. I'm glad you're, uh, you're in the URC and uh, it's been it's been good to have you have you here right down the street in Torrance. So it's, you know, ho we're hoping to have you uh, on the program quite a bit, if if you're willing. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. this is what many people don't understand across uh, the U.S. and around the world, that many people think of Southern California as a cesspool of uh, depravity. And oh. it can be that. <laughs> it's kind of that. It certainly <laughs> has influence uh, of those sorts. But there are also some of the best churches in the whole world. Yeah. Yeah, in Southern California, and I and I try to remind our congregation of that mm -hmm. that we are so blessed. We are to have to be yep. surrounded by so many outstanding churches, and and even to get pulpit supply for us when I'm away or sick. Yeah, it's not difficult. Yeah, because there's so many tremendous pastors and interns within you know mm -hmm. an hour's drive in Southern California that whereas other places have no access. Yeah, no, that's true. I mean, I you know. Bob Godfrey here in the church. <laughs> when I'm out, you know, we put Bob in. Nobody misses me. <laughs> That's a great guy to pull off the bench. <laughs> it is a good. It keeps a people Hall of Famer. coming. You know, a first ballot Hall of Famer <laughs> is is it ready to pinch it for you. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, well, now you've been in Torrance for for how long? Uh, about three and a half years. Okay, after three and a half years. So we thought maybe we talk a little bit about preaching. Maybe that's a that's a good place to kind of begin. Um, you know. It's a, it's an interesting time to preach the gospel, um, but I was just reading someone today. Maybe it was I was watching um, some video. I think that maybe it was our Reformation and Heritage books had put out their new podcast, and they had Jeff Thomas on, and he was talking about how confused today <laughs> people are about the gospel. You know, and that's that's a remarkable thing. You know, that in our day, after all this history, after all the Reformation, the way that we had, there's still confusion about what the gospel is and what is the sort of principal aim in preaching. Like, what, what are we what are we trying to accomplish in, in our preaching? And, um, you know, you said there's a lot of solid churches around Southern California, but there are also a lot of others that, that um, yeah, they're simply TED Talks. You know, that's yeah. kind of what they've become today. So, you know, what 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 is what is preaching? What why why is preaching so important? Why do we have to continue to talk about this and convince people of what we call means of grace so that they'll value that? I mean, that's what I feel like, Dan's like it's really part of the battle today is that there's um to convince people that they need this as a means of grace for God's help to them you know? And I don't know. It's just, maybe it's a day we just have so much recreation and freedom and internet and whatever else that it's just not valued like it used to be, but it is a challenge for us. Yeah. I tell people, so in, in the Reformed churches, in, in the Second Helvetic Confession, we say that the preaching of the gospel is the gospel. Right. When done in accordance with God's word, it is as authoritative as the word itself. And so I tell people, if Jesus told you 
I am going to show up at 10 a.m. on Sunday morning and I'm going to speak to you directly. Yeah. Do you think people would come to hear that? Yeah. Of course they would. Yeah. Who would not? Yeah. Who would miss that? Yeah. That's exactly what happens yeah. every Lord's Day. Christ comes to us through the preaching of the gospel by his minister, and he speaks to us just as if he were standing there. Mm -hmm. It is that authoritative, and it's empowered by the Holy Spirit. It's not the minister that makes it authoritative right. or powerful. It's right. the Holy Spirit. Right. The Holy Spirit takes that word through a, through a fallen vessel, mm -hmm. through feet of clay, and he empowers it, and he transforms hearts. Yeah. If we understand what preaching truly is, who, who, what, what could be better than that? I tell people, you could give me tickets on the 50 yard line to the Super Bowl and, and backstage passes or whatever. And I would still come to church because mm -hmm. I can't get Christ himself speaking to me yeah. at the Super Bowl. Yeah. And, and this is the whole point of the book of, he I just finished Hebrews. So it's fresh in my mind, but this is the whole point of the book of Hebrews. Jesus is still speaking today. Absolutely. You know, but we're not quite satisfied with the manner and the way that he's speaking to us. So, you know, if you, you could announce a bunch of things happening on Sunday, you know, if you're slaying people in the spirit, you know, if you're, if you're, you're going to have some kind of show, some kind of concert, um, you know, you're going to do something big for the people, you know, they'll be there. Yeah. They'll be there for the events. But in a sense, this is the moment that Christ, you know, we used to say in the Reformation, the, the, the pastor is the Vox Day. Yes. Is the and and you know I know that's been abused. I know there's been authority problems. I know there's been people who've, you know, used the pulpit as a kind of bully pulpit to control people. We we recognize that, but it doesn't take away from what the act of preaching is. Right? It is the voice of Christ, and it's it's heavenly speech. That's Absolutely. what I love. That's what I love about Hebrews is that what he's saying is, listen, you know, this is not speech from earth. There's something distinctive about this because when the man that is sent proclaims God's word, proclaims the gospel, it is Christ himself delivering through that word power and a means of grace to the people for salvation, for life, for righteousness, for everything. And um, yeah, that's that's what um, we've got to continue to emphasize today. For people. And I just, I just think we're Americans. You know, the experience is, is not great enough for us. But if you truly know what's happening, there's no greater experience. Yeah. This is why I tell people. I know. You know, yeah, you might have uh, the outward um, expression of experience, like we see in Pentecostal churches or whatever, people crying or waving their hands or rolling on the floor, whatever they do. And, and people think that's an experience. Mm -hmm. But when you understand, I was just telling someone this the other day who's, who's still uh, not a cessationist. He's kind of open but cautious and wants to leave room for those ecstatic gifts. And I said, okay, fine. But let me tell you about experience. <laughs> in, the, in the Lord's Day worship, when God himself welcomes us into his presence, we enter the heavenly throne room. Yeah. Welcomed yeah. by God himself. And he speaks to us. He greets us. We confess our sins to him. He forgives us. Mm -hmm. We hear the declaration of pardon. We confess our faith mm -hmm. with, with the, uh, the creeds or the catechism. And we sing praise to him. We pray to him. And then Christ himself speaks to us through the preaching of the gospel and the minister. And then in the Lord's Supper, we feed on the very body and blood of Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. He does not come down to the altar, as Rome says. We go to him. The Holy Spirit takes us to him, into heaven, and we feed on his body and blood. You ask me exactly how that happens, I'll tell you, I don't know, because it's a mystery. <laughs> yeah. We can only go as far as Scripture goes, but Scripture does go that far. Yeah. You want to talk about experience? What experience could be better than that? Yeah, no. It's exactly amazing. Right. When you truly know what happens in Reformed worship, nothing could be better. So this is what I, how I try to um, encourage people to come to the second service which has always been a difficulty, yeah. you yeah. know, here in the URC, we are required to have two services yeah. going back prior to the Synod of Dort reformed churches had difficulty with attendance at the second service. It's not a new thing. It's not an American right. thing. This goes all the way back to the 16th yeah. century, but people who are um, not as faithful to the second service, I try to encourage them. Do you know what really happens? Yeah. Yeah. If you knew what really happened in worship, why, why would you miss this? Yeah. What could be better than this? It's yeah. truly amazing, and that it happens every week. This is not just once a year. Right. Every week, God does this for us. Mm -hmm. When you know that, there's no better 
experience than right. true reformed worship. Right. Right. Absolutely. It's funny that that Synod of Dort, they said that even if it's just the minister and his family, you're still to have that service. You know? So it 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 showed their great conviction and value of it. But the challenge, like you're saying, for the people to understand and appreciate this, um, you know, I, I mean, across denominational lines, uh, you know, even in America years ago, almost every Cross denominational lines, almost every church had an evening worship service. Now it's axed off. And, you know, the mornings we're typically getting, you know, what, what are we doing? You know, if it's, and that's why I appreciate what you said. You kind of went through briefly there the, the dialogue of worship. Yeah. Now there's an actual dialogue happening. You know, we begin with a call to worship, you know, that God is calling us into his presence, sort of bookends, the calling and the and the um, the benediction to say, we've formally entered into this special gathering in the presence of God with his people. And he is calling us, he's blessing us. We're responding in song. We're receiving his law. We're confessing our sins. We're receiving an announcement, a pardon. You know, what is what is more fulfilling than to have the ambassador sent by God to proclaim the gospel and to say, you know, sons and daughters, your sins are forgiven, you know? Then we respond with, uh, you know, praise, offering, thanksgiving, and prayer. And then, you know, we sit under the living voice. You know, the word is powerful, living, sharper than any two-edged sword. The living voice of Christ who speaks to us from heaven words of comfort and words of peace. Sure, confronting our sin, showing us the way in Christ, and then we respond in song, and he sends us out with a blessing. I mean, you're absolutely right. If you're going to talk experience and you're understanding experience properly, that's the best you're going to get. Absolutely. In this life. And this is what I told this guy. Like, yeah, you might not see the outward expression of that. Right. You know, we Reformed people are not uh, always the most emotive yeah. outwardly. And that's okay. We can't judge people yeah. that just because they're not outwardly expressing it, we can't say, well, they're not having an experience yeah. internally. Mm -hmm. So just because we might not express those things in a visible way, certainly in our hearts, when we truly know what's happening, there's a real experience there yeah. that we can't shortchange mm -hmm. or deny just because it's not expressed outwardly. Right. Right. Nehemiah, I was just preaching Nehemiah not so long ago. It was amazing when they they sort of had the reform of the church after the exiles were brought back. And you see this renewal in the covenant community. Clearly, the Spirit's involved in that. And, um, you know, it says that as soon as the word was read, it was like a five-hour reading service. You know, they weren't worried about time and all that. That... Um, uh, it says that all the people lifted up their hands and said, amen. I, you know, I thought to myself, you know, we might get a little nervous with people putting up their hands for the music, <laughs> you know, because it's like emotional subjectivism. But people are raising their hands for receiving the word. I'd never be critical for that. Absolutely. I mean, that's a, that's a beautiful thing. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And one of the be great benefits, just going through the liturgy, one of the great benefits of a traditional reformed liturgy is it's shot through with the gospel. Mm -hmm. We don't just hear the gospel in the sermon, right? We hear it over and over throughout the liturgy. And we're really led, led away uh, with God's blessing, which yeah. is gospel as well. The benediction, God's blessing is part of the gospel. So even if the sermon, I tell people, even if the sermon is a total dud, yeah, you still get the law and the gospel in the liturgy. Yeah. Yeah. Did you see this, um, this Jesus revolution film yet? No, you should watch it. No, it's worth your time. I'm sorry. I know okay. Dan's like, what happened to you? No, no, seriously. <laughs> it's it's worth your time. And I only say that because it captures something I think was really interesting when sort of Calvary Chapel formed and Chuck Smith was preaching. They show him, it's like Kelsey Grammer who's playing the part, right? Which right. <laughs> is really interesting. But uh, they show him at first preaching in this church and it's it's full of it's full of suits and ties and old people and you know he's preaching bad against the culture and he's preaching how wrong everything is and he's saying the wickedness of our times and you know a few nods you know amen amen and then this Lonnie Frisbee guy comes in and he sort of he brings all his hippie friends into the church and what Chuck did which I think this captures, this is, you know, my kind of assessment is he then sort of transformed the ministry. He adapted the ministry to, to the hippie culture that was coming in. And in both cases, it, and it went all into ecstatic experience. Like they, they capture that well in the movie. But I thought, I thought to myself, the, the real point of that was up front, it didn't, they didn't seem to grasp. They seemed to capture really well that the gospel really wasn't central 
in the message. And then he went to this other movement and accommodated this other movement that threw out all those old convictions. So he transformed the ministry, giving this guy Lonnie Frisbee a platform. And in both cases, the gospel, the gospel was lost. And I think that's that's important that sometimes the picture of the Reformed Church is we're just grumpy against sin. Right. We're we're a people who are angry at the culture, we're yelling at the culture. And and what I think what we have to continue to emphasize is just what Jesus said. Listen, the gospel's for sinners. The gospel is not for the righteous. The gospel's for sinners. But we have to keep front and center that message because that is the power of God to deliver people, not to adapt it to all the cultural wants of the time. Yeah. And we can't lead with what we're against. Yeah. That's not going to be appealing to anybody. No. So you we could talk all day about the ills of our culture yeah. and, and never come to an end of it. But that's not going to be attractive to people. And and the spirit is not going to work through that, just railing against the culture. Yeah. He works through the proclamation of the gospel and how it transforms sinners. So yeah, of course, we can point out um air ills of the day and and yeah. and problems with the culture but we ha- we can't lead with that and we always have to come back to the gospel right and guess what right. the ills of the culture seep into the church as well because we bring them in <laughs> yeah we're part of the problem exactly. by the way you know scott and I, scott clark and i were just talking about this the other day we did a recording and i said you know we're we're really good at saying look at all the bad people out there doing all these bad things and and we don't really begin with listen whenever we see sort of response throughout history of renewal in the church where there is a, a turning back to the Lord, which we're all worried about right now because culture is just lost to paganism and we are in like kind of a new medieval age. It feels like, you know, just darkness. But um, whenever we see that, what we see is God's people first weeping for their sins and then being consoled in the gospel. It's like Nehemiah leaving with a message of the joy of the Lord is your strength. Don't sorrow. And I, I think that's exactly what we have to capture again in the church. Listen, um, yeah, things are bad. It's always been bad. Of course. It's always been bad. Yes. There's never been an age. In fact, we just experienced the change in a way that's uncomfortable to us when we lived in Christendom. But in the first century, it was, you know, what Rome was doing like sexually. It was, it's horrible. There's no golden age in church. No history. golden age. It was always bad. But what people need most right now is the joy of the gospel. Yes. And it seems to me in all the sort of extremes we see, this is what gets lost. Whether you're a culture warrior, whether you're woke, you know, all the camps that form in this, the crucial thing that people need gets buried. And that's, I think we just got to keep pushing on with uh, compelling people to say, this is why you need the gospel preached to you every week. Well, you mentioned earlier about people who are confused what the gospel is. Mm-hmm. And that's always been the case as well. I was just talking the other day at our church in a uh, church history study about Jay Gresham Machen. Mm-hmm. And in his day, the confusion of the gospel was the social gospel, the early yeah. 20th century. Yeah, It's not that they outright denied the gospel, the Protestant liberals. Right. They didn't come right, right out and say it's, it's bogus. It just got edged out by all the social activism yeah. that they were doing and, and were encouraging people to do. And it's understandable. In the early 20th century, you got hunger issues. You have yeah. the abuse of alcohol. This is the era of the temperance movement. All these, uh, the World War I, mm-hmm. the Armenian genocide, all these horrible things uh, around the world that need humanitarian aid. And so that became attached to the gospel. So part of the gospel, they said, is working to end all these social ills. Yeah. In our day... It's not so much the social gospel as it was in the early 20th century. It's the... It's close. <laughs> it's it's close. the social justice gospel. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. all the things in the social justice movement that many will say, this is the gospel. So so they're not going to deny, oh yeah, Jesus died for your sins, rose on the third day, yeah. and, and you need to believe in him. But also you need to do this. You need to help to work to end all these social justice Yeah, evils. and I mean, it's just, it's just shifted, you know, it's just a new sort of Marxism you know, where the social gospel of that day did focus on sort of cultural issues of poverty and these sort of things. Now it's just shifted to race. Mostly. You know? Yeah. Mostly. And, and and sexuality. And sexuality. LGBTQ stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So this becomes front and center. And um, 
And, and listen, the church has a lot to say on these issues. What does the gospel say about race? Well, it says it's all the barriers have been torn down. Sure. Um, there's now neither Jew nor Greek. In other words, listen, the gospel's for all tribes, tongues, peoples, and nations. We have a solution to this problem. Yes. Um, with sexuality, yeah, we believe something good was made at creation that the prince of darkness has seek to wreck in humanity and has done really well with that. Um, but the truth will prevail on this. Light will shine. The point is, is that we have an answer to that too. Yes. But none of that takes place. And that's why I think you're raising a good point. That's a lot of burden to take all the social ills of the culture on and put it on the back of the church and then bury the key solution to all that. Yes. Which is exactly what I think's happened. And, and at the foundation. And being sidetracked. Absolutely. At the foundation, that's law. That's not gospel. Yeah, it's law. That's the great commandment. Love right. your neighbor. Right. That is not the gospel. Absolutely. So even if we are called to address those things, that's law. That's yeah, not and, part of the gospel. And Lloyd-Jones, I mean, Lloyd-Jones wrote a lot about the social gospel in his day. And, you know, he says, if you want to know what's going to happen, it, it's going it to, it's, it's what happened to us in these things. Basically, I'm reading kind of back, but um, the church is emptied. Yeah. There's no power in right. that. There's no power in, and it proves our point of the power of the gospel to keep people to this heavenly inheritance that's been given to them in Christ is through that power. But if you exchange the message for trying to solve all the societal ills, you lose the very power that keeps people for the most important issue of life, which is, by the way, not social ill, but the problem of a wrathful God because of our sins, who is just and righteous and will punish sin eternally in hell, sinners. You need to be freed from that. That's the big issue that gets buried in all this. Yeah, and going back to Bob Godfrey, he said, people can go elsewhere to hear about ending poverty, mm -hmm. ending racism, ending sexual depravity, all these things. You can hear that many places and many mm -hmm. places do, do, uh, do well in, in addressing those things, right. trying to end those evils. Only the church has the gospel. Yeah. So why in the world would we compete with those other government agencies or NGOs or whatever yeah. in trying to address those things when we are the only ones who have the truth of the gospel right. to give to people. And I think Lloyd-Jones went on to say, I think it might've been in Preachers and Preaching, but he went on to say, listen, if you want to affect the culture on these things in a positive way, the church has to do its fundamental job of proclaiming the gospel, setting people free. They will then go out and love their neighbor in a way that actually affects the culture and helps people, right? I mean, they're going to do good to their neighbor. The only way that's going to be accomplished is when they're truly set free from what's most important, right? Uh, in what's most, most important. So, you know, the point is, is we're trying to solve all society, societal ills. And what's happened is that becomes the gospel, yes. like you're saying. That becomes what <laughs> we think gospel is. And front and center is 1 Corinthians 15. The gospel I proclaim to you, Christ, Christ came, Christ died, Christ rose from the dead, and he has forgiven your sins. If we lose that, we have, we have nothing to offer anyone. Right. And there are many implications from the gospel, many yeah, outworkings of the saying. gospel, yeah. of course, exactly. Mm -hmm. Loving your neighbor in yeah. every form, of course, yeah. but that is not the gospel itself. Right. Now, lest we be accused of only picking on the progressive side, let's talk about those <laughs> who want to... Yeah confuse the gospel or add to the gospel yeah. with the other sort of societal transformation. There are those who will say the gospel includes taking dominion over the entire earth in this present evil age. That's just been taken by storm right now, especially in reform world. Uh, and that's just, I think it's important to say what you just said. That's just the other side of the same coin. It's all transformationalism. It, they're, they're both, they're both, Inter it's kind of like legalism and antinomianism are the same side of, of, of uh, are opposite sides of the coin, right? Yes. Same coin. Yes. They're related. They, they work off each other. You know? <laughs> so what you have is sort of on the progressive liberal side, you just have compromise, you know, liberal theology. It's what Machen, you know, went after. But now what we've seen is this sort of new, and, and, it, and it's really fascinating, sort of, you know, the transformational model um, which is doing the same sort of thing with an angry face. Yes. 
you know, and, and how does that win people? Where is our job now to transform cities and transform America and save, you know, the, se- the, the secular city? I just preach Hebrews. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in chapter 13 and he says, listen, you got to go outside the city and you got to come to Christ, come to your altar, and you have to bear his reproach because here we have no enduring city. I think that's a takedown toward of theonomy. Absolutely. It's a takedown of theonomy. Yeah. Um, and 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 it seems to me that people have fallen into this as the great mission now of the church yeah. is to save post-Christendom a culture going to hell in a handbasket. And I like to say, where did the church most flourish in history? Um, before Christendom. Yes. <laughs> you know, the days of the apostles, when there was persecution, when the governments, you know, were living, uh, doing terrible things to the people. Now, doesn't, that doesn't mean we don't want moral government. Of course. It doesn't mean we don't want righteousness. We pray for that. But we also recognize under God's sovereignty, these may be unique opportunities for us to continue to preach the gospel in a culture where these things haven't been distinguished very well in right. the past. 